Elfriede Jelinek's novel The Piano Teacher became a sensation from the day it was first published in 1983. It's considered to be her most famous work. In 2001, the movie director Michael Haneke chose to adapt the novel and invite the incredible Isabelle Huppert to play the lead female role, which actually won her the Best Actress Award at Cannes Film Festival the same year. I'm sure you have heard of the term femsol that has been circulating on social media for a long time now. This label, which initially was used to refer to a celibate woman, voluntarily or not, is now an aesthetic, basically. It's a Tumblr girl, feral girl, an unhinged girl, a sad girl, a messy girl, pick your favorite. People come up with all these labels, but they essentially mean the same thing. What women are drawn to is unpolished female representation, whether it be music or cinema. Certain female characters have now been labeled femcells, and certain movies are believed to have a femcell or an incel vibe. Which brings us to The Piano Teacher, that might be considered by some to be a femcell movie classic. Like how Taxi Driver is viewed as an incel classic. I've re-watched both movies back to back, and I was very surprised how well they mirror each other and what great commentary they can provide on femcel and incel communities. So that's what I'll be doing in this video. Compare the two just for fun, but with a focus on the piano teacher, of course, because my channel is about female movie characters. Erika is the main character of The Piano Teacher. In the book, she's a woman in her late 30s. In the movie, I believe she's a decade older. Both Travis from Taxi Driver and Erika are living a repressed, joyless existence. While Taxi Driver doesn't offer a deep explanation as to why Travis is the way he is, you can assume his experiences as a Marine during the Vietnam War are the cause of his mental illness, his insomnia, depression, and paranoia. The Piano Teacher provides more than enough information to understand Erika and reveal the main culprit of her misery, her mother. Erica's mother, who is old enough to be her grandmother, doesn't have a name. She is simply referred to as Mother with a capital M. And this is pretty fitting, since she acts as an omnipresent authority over every aspect of Erica's life. There are two quotes from the book that sum it up pretty well. Trust is fine, but control is better. And maternal eye is the eye of the law. Erica and her mother still live together. Erica has her own room on paper, but there is no lock on the door and no bed, since Erica is forced to sleep with her mother. They also share a bank account and are trying to save money for a better apartment. This is one of the reasons why Erica is not allowed to buy anything for herself, things like dresses or makeup. The other reason, and the main reason really, is just her mother's control in nature. Ah. <laughs> Even when Erica was a child, her mother would never buy her anything she wanted. She would make empty promises, tricking Erica into practicing the piano even more if she wanted to get something in return. At some point, Erica started shoplifting. Now, her adult version tries to compensate by buying all these dresses that she can't even wear because mother still dictates what Erica puts on every day. In the book, these dresses are referred to as corpses in Erica's wardrobe. But the most important thing is that it's her property and not her mother's. But mother can still get angry and cut any of Erica's dresses into pieces. Mother was the one who chose the career for Erica. She was motivated by money and status, so it had to be an artistic profession. The world's famous pianist. That was her ideal for her daughter. I think the movie paints a bit of a different picture of Erica. It seems like she's this respected, extremely talented music professor who happens to have a dark sexual secret, while the original book character is pretty much a failure. Erica was on her journey to achieve the status of a concert pianist. Mother isolated her from any outside influence, other family members and all potential friends. Erica was not allowed to play outside with other kids. She had to practice every day. If she refused to do it, mother would smack her. Neighbors complained about the noise, but mother was too enthusiastic about her child. She cultivated a sense of superiority in Erica. She was a genius, one in a million. When the time finally came to showcase her skills at a very important concert, Erica failed miserably. She had no choice but to become a regular teacher. Travis also picks up a dead-end job as a night shift taxi driver to remedy his insomnia. He feels embarrassed about it and tells his parents that he is working for the government. I would argue that he demonstrates the same kind of behavioral tendencies as Erica. He can become obsessive and is not a stranger to self-discipline. After all, Travis mentions that he has been given an honorable discharge from military service, but now he is struggling to readjust to life. Despite their tough exterior, at their core, both characters are insecure, unremarkable people who might have a talent but not enough to make something out of themselves. They're stuck in their repetitive routines and feel too unworthy and depressed to strive for better careers or more money. People in incel communities use the acronym LDAR, which means lie down and rot, to describe their state of hopelessness and acceptance that their circumstances will never change and it's better to give up on life. When it comes to incels and femcels, it's not only about inability to find 
a romantic partner or get laid. These people don't feel accepted and validated in any sphere of their life, which then breeds feelings of bitterness and alienation. The existential bleakness and isolation end up fueling these people's superiority complex and hatred towards others. Despite their loneliness, Travis and Erica act morally superior to other people, which makes it harder for them to form genuine connections. Travis views the inhabitants of New York City as scum of the earth. This city here is like an open sewer, you know, it's full of filth and scum. Erica likes committing random malicious acts in public. From the novel, you learn that Erica likes taking large instruments on trains and hitting people with them. She also enjoys kicking or stepping on other passengers' feet and watch how they blame someone else. The feeling of getting away with something thrills her. Since Erica's dream to become a concert pianist got destroyed, she also uses her authority to prevent any of her students from reaching the top. Erica likes deciding who is gifted and who isn't. She enjoys selecting and rejecting students because it makes up for her past. If you have no motivation to become a pianist in a box of striptease, it's to make my time. Kendall Peterson, in his research paper about the piano teacher, writes, quote, She denies them their growth and development as artists in the same way she was denied growth and development as a child and a woman. End quote. Erica's mother totally enables this behavior, and she might even be the one who pushed this idea on Erica. As she says, you didn't make it, why should others reach the top? Personne ne doit te surpasser. What's interesting is that Erica's only female student, Anna, mirrors what she had experienced in her childhood almost to a T. Anna's mother and Erica's mother are basically the same people who fail to recognize how much their child is sacrificing. Pardon? Non, vous avez dit nous avons tout sacrifié. C'est Anna qui a tout sacrifié. Both mothers don't see any beauty in their kids and drill into their brains that if they don't become the best of the best, they have no worth as people. Mother made sure that Erica's head was never preoccupied with such trivial things as beauty. She enjoyed crushing the spirit and confidence of her daughter by never calling her pretty. Like it says in the book, mother prefers inflicting injuries herself than supervising the therapy. Quote, she's everything but beautiful. She's talented, lovely to listen to, but not lovely to look at. She's homely and that's what her mother keeps telling her, so the child won't think she's beautiful. The only way she will ever captivate anybody is with her own knowledge and her ability." End quote. I don't have a sentiment, Walter. You would be better to put that in your head, and even if I have one day, they won't triumph with my intelligence. Beauty and pretty privilege are most discussed topics in incel and especially femcel communities. Many femcels believe that due to society's unrealistic beauty standards, they are unable to find a partner. Some even feel that to be a real femcel, you must have some sort of defect. There should be something wrong with you that makes you different from other, so to say, normal women. And often, it is something related to the physical appearance, but it can also be a mental illness, which is Erica's case. There is nothing special about her in terms of appearance. I don't even think the novel spends much time describing in her. Erica is average looking, she blends with the others, and she knows this. Erica does want to improve her looks by wearing makeup and beautiful dresses that she can't stop purchasing, which in insult communities is called looks maxing. Erica is also well aware that there is something wrong with her, that her sexual fantasies and behavior are not common, but she's content with that and she isn't actively looking for a man. Travis, on the other hand, is more oblivious to his shortcomings and mental issues and finds fault in everyone but himself. This is one of the main differences between incels and femcels. Typically, women internalize their negative emotions and men externalize them. In the movie, you see Travis working on his body, which can be viewed as an example of looks maxing. Unlike Erica, though, Travis is actively seeking a girlfriend. He tries flirting with women and eventually his eyes fall on Betsy, whom he immediately worships. She appeared like an angel out of this filthy mess. Both Erica and Travis stalk their potential romantic interests, they fail at reading the room and are extremely self-obsessed because of their feeling of superiority, so they never think about the other person's desires. In Travis's case, on their first date, he takes Patsy to an adult movie theater, which in general contradicts his initial thoughts about her as a pure innocent angel. When Betsy rejects Travis, his opinion about her and about women drastically changes. Well, she is just like the others, cold and distant. Paul Schrader, who wrote the screenplay for Taxi Driver, has explained in one of the interviews that it wasn't just Travis's naivety that led him to pick this particular place for the first date. Quote, 
There was something in him that really wanted to shove her face in the filth that he felt, to dirty her, to say, look at this, this is what I'm really like, how could you love someone like me, end quote. It's true that people who want to find negativity in something will always find it. Incels and femcels problem is not that the world is against them, it's their own highly negative self-image. Even if you present them with the perfect potential love interest, they will find a way to mess it up because they have already developed certain biases. Due to socialization, men tend to get angry and aggressive when they're romantic rejected, and women might feel sad, often blaming themselves. It's very hard for Travis to accept Betsy's wishes to never speak to him again. In his letters to the family, Travis lies that he's been dating Betsy for months. He keeps sending her flowers, keeps calling her, and he even comes to her work to confront her face to face. Travis has a weird case of savior complex when it comes to women. He believed Betsy needed to be rescued from her loneliness and her work environment. I'm there to protect you. <laughs> After things don't work out with her, he becomes obsessed with saving a different girl named Iris, an underage prostitute. You sure a young girl, you should be at home now. After the rejection, Travis becomes increasingly isolated and disturbed. He gets consumed by his violent thoughts to hurt people. He buys guns and begins to exercise intensely every day. He imagines himself as a hero whose mission is to cleanse the city of filth and corruption. At first, he plans to assassinate Betsy's employer, a presidential candidate, Charles Palantine, but ends up murdering Iris's pimp, Matthew, and a couple of other people in the brothel. Incels refer to desirable, successful men as chads, and in a way, Charles and Matthew are these men. Charles is the example of career success, while Matthew represents success with women. Travis despises both. Paul Schrader viewed this man as father figures of Betsy and Iris. Quote, he tries to kill the father figure of one, but he fails, so he kills the father figure of the other and becomes a hero. End quote. As soon as Erica was born, her father left. Eventually, he lost his mind and died in the asylum. The only male figure Erica had in her life was her charming cousin, who was treated very differently by women in her family and was allowed way more things. Mother raised Erica to never trust men. She always warned her of envious horde that would try to destroy her achievements, and that horde was made up most entirely of men. Mother was always scared that a man would reshape Erica, so she took it upon herself to try and protect her from any potential suitors. Not that there were many. From the book, you learn that Erica had a couple of experiments with the opposite sex, but they were weren't that good. One time she slept with a salesman who tried to pick her up in a cafe just to shut him up. Other times she had dates with a young law student and a young high school teacher. In Erica's experience, as soon as men get what they want, they leave or cheat. During these hookups, if you can call them that, Erica felt nothing, and after all of them, she couldn't wait to return to her mother. In his paper, The Piano Teacher, a case study in perversion and sadomasochism, psychoanalyst Christopher Christian argues that Erica attempts to differentiate from her mother by assuming the father's role in the household. Mother is retired, so Erica is the sole provider, actively working and earning money. Mother does the housework and the cooking because Erica doesn't want to ruin her pianist hands. Their dynamic does sometimes resemble that of a married couple. Mother interrogates Erica all the time if she doesn't come home on time. She can call her to work when she pleases. Je suis pas un nourrisson. Bon, il faut que j'y aille là. In the book, it says that only death can separate them. The most telling example of this dynamic happens when one night Erica attacks her mother in bed. She starts forcibly kissing her, sticking her hands under her mother's nightgown. She assumes the masculine role because she herself was never treated like a woman. Generally, Erica views femininity and womanhood as a wound. She mutilates her female parts with her father's razor blade, which suits the mansion theory. Quote, Erica feels solid wood in the place where the carpenter made a hole in any genuine female. Erica's wood is spongy, decaying, lonesome wood in the timber forest and the rot is spreading." End quote. Travis also feels rot and decay, but not inside himself. He is looking outward. Everything around him is rotting. Someday a real rain will come and wash all the scum off the streets. Both movies picture very depressing urban environments. It's cold and dirty and lonely, which perfectly reflects the characters in the world. Erica's dysfunctional sexual behavior and fantasies are a direct result of abuse from her mother. Since they sleep together, mother guards Erica's hands. These hands are supposed to practice, not be used to pleasure oneself. So Erica became completely detached from her body, which led to her developing so-called paraphilia, a condition when a person is aroused by atypical objects or activities. And there are various paraphilic disorders, including voyeurism, masochism, and urophilia, which involves the use of urine in an erotic way for arousal 
arousal or humiliation. Erica has this three. Travis also has a voyeuristic side to him. He drives every night around the city, staring at people with jealousy or disgust in his eyes. Stalking people, going to adult movie theater is also a big part of it. One time, a passenger Travis picks up wants to spy on his wife, and Travis is forced to participate in this too. Erica's voyeuristic nature manifests in going to peep shows and other adult shops. She also likes going to special parks where couples usually fool around. Erica never touches herself, but she does other things. For example, at peep shows, she might take a tissue that a man before her used and threw in the trash bin and smell it. Another thing Erica does sometimes when she gets too excited is pee. This act replaces the climax for her. In the story, there are two urinating scenes. The first time Erica does it, during her spine session on a couple who is hooking up. Her second time happens under more unusual circumstances. Erica mutilates the hand of her student Anna by placing a bunch of broken glass in the pocket of her jacket, preventing her from playing at the upcoming concert. There is a chance her hand might never fully recover, so Erica destroyed this girl's career. <laughs> There are two explanations why Erica does this. As I've said before, Erica doesn't want her students to be more successful than her. So that's the first one. And the second one is revenge out of jealousy. Erica saw Walter, her other student who is trying to romantically pursue her, being friendly and flirtatious with Anna. Erica had rejected Walter's advances many times, but for a woman like her who has never had a normal relationship, this attention was still flattering, especially from a guy like Walter who can easily have anybody. Walter wanted to make Erica jealous, that was his strategy and it worked. Fem cells use the same vocabulary as incels. So in their world, conventionally attractive women who can easily get a guy are called stasis. Fem cells aspire to be like them, but at the same time they mock and despise them. Erica is extremely envious of her young female students because her own youth was wasted. Erica gossips with her mother about them, she wants to have their clothes and hair, so that's why Anna gets the worst of it. There's also a voyeuristic aspect to what Erica does to Anna. Erica gets excited as she witnesses how people around Anna start pointing fingers at each other, trying to find the person who did this. Eventually, she excuses herself to go and empty her bladder. Erica's last paraphilic disorder is masochism, the enjoyment of experiencing pain. I've talked about one of the theories behind Erica's harming herself and how it reflects her attitude towards being a woman. But Kendall Peterson, the researcher and writer, believes that this self-mutilation plays as the act of pleasuring oneself. Since Erica can't experience pleasure in the usual way, this is her version of it. Peterson thinks that Erica doesn't hate her body and that she's instead an active participant and a warrior of herself. It's true that Erica views pain as a variety of pleasure. Erica would gladly cross the border to her own murder, it says in the novel. But at the same time, Throughout the story, it's made clear that Erica feels nothing even when she harms herself. Erica is extremely confused about her sexuality, and she doesn't know what she wants from life. Consumerism, specifically television and pornography, greatly contribute to Erica's view on the relationship between a man and a woman, and on her masochistic fantasies. Erica and her mother watch TV every day. This is their favorite pastime together. Even Mikhail Haneke, the director of the movie, admitted in one of the interviews that the theme of the dangers of the media and TV is always present in his work. Quote, when we take the news that comes on TV as reality, it creates a state of derealization. To Erica, the reality of what she sees in the adult shop is more real than the feeling of reality in her normal life. End quote. I believe it's applicable to Travis as well. You see him watching TV all the time. He consumes anything that comes on. The news, soap operas. He's a frequent visitor to an adult movie theater. Both characters' ideas of intimacy and relationship between a man and a woman might be built on images they absorb. In Travis's case, it might explain his eagerness to always try and save women even when some of them don't need it. Erica's images are usually rough, a man dominating a woman. She herself has never been in S&M type of of relationship, and it becomes apparent when she meets Walter, a male student who becomes interested in her. Walter is in his 20s. He comes from a good family, he's charming, confident, talented, and multifaceted. He's not only into music, but also into sport. Walter is the type of person who wants to gather as much experience as possible. He's excited by obstacles. Compared to him, Eric is a child. She isn't only stunned sexually, but emotionally too. When Walter meets Erica for the first time, he's very impressed by her skill and knowledge about music. He immediately 
expresses his desire to be in her class. And even though Erica votes against him at the audition, Walter manages to get in. I personally really can't see how somebody like Walter can become romantically involved with someone like Erica. My only explanation would be that since Erica is so closed off and distant, she becomes some sort of challenge for Walter and he wants to crack her open. Bon, professeur, at first, Erica is very uncomfortable by Walter's persistence. She doesn't want to meet him outside of class hours. Walter wants to have a conventional romantic relationship with dates and kisses and lovemaking. And it's hard for Erica to act like that. Sometimes, she even has a physical reaction to intimacy, like extreme bouts of coughing or vomiting. <coughs> Besides, Erica can't feel happiness. She never lets her guard down, but deep inside, she longs for somebody to come and take her away from her mother. Erica wants to entrust herself to someone else, but on her terms. In the novel, she even imagines her happy ending with Walter. Quote, she imagines she's being rewarded for loyal service in the realm of art. If male willpower can actually lead her away from her tried and true mother, then her work has been a success. The student will soon be getting his degree. She's got a job with a decent salary. She decides for him that the age difference is trivial. End quote. I think this is another difference between femcells and incels when they talk about relationships. Some incels are too preoccupied with sex and their entitlement to it, while fem themselves just want to have a good relationship with a man who won't use them and abuse them. Their final goal is commitment and love. Despite Erica's bad experiences with men, she still has hope that Walter is different. The first intimate interaction between Walter and Erica happens in the restroom. Erica runs there after the incident with Anna and Walter goes after her. Erica? Erica feels reluctant to make out with Walter and she doesn't feel comfortable with him leading, so quickly Erica draws the line between them and takes control into her own hands, in a literal sense. And she has her own rules, like Walter must stay still and not talk, but Erica is being rough and Walter tells her about it many times. Similar to Travis on his first date, Erica doesn't care what her partner wants. Walter's disobedience ultimately frustrates Erica and she stops the whole thing. No, I plus envie de toucher ça maintenant. Walter then begs her to continue by promising that he will follow her instructions and he doesn't lie. When Erica suddenly pauses and takes her hand away, Walter stays still. In Erica's eyes, he passes the test. She can now reveal her secret to him, which is such a striking example of how naive Erica is. Je ferai parvenir mes instructions. À récrit. Walter, on the other hand, is pretty thrilled to finally get at least something from Erica and he's determined to bring her out of her shell. What's amusing is that both Erica and Travis express their true mind through writing. Travis keeps a personal diary and Erica writes her ultimate fantasy in a letter to Walter. Nowadays, femcells and incels have their own forums and pages where they can express their frustrations. In her letter, Erica expresses step by step what she wants Walter to do to her. She would like to be made utterly immobile. She wants to be tied, bound, gagged, hit, kicked, whipped and threatened. Walter should completely ignore her pleading. He shouldn't spare her. Erica even begs for rape and a golden shower. While the movie tries to obscure and blur Erica's intentions to make the audience guess the truth, the novel pretty much clarifies everything. Erica doesn't want all these things to really happen. Quote, please don't hurt me. That's what's written illegibly between the lines. The letter is the fruit of Erica's years of silent reflection. She now hopes that love will prevent anything from occurring. She will insist on it, but an amorous reply will make up for his refusal. Love excuses and forgives. That's what Erica thinks." End quote. It's obvious again, probably more from the book than from the movie, that Erica is very confused and doesn't fully comprehend what she truly wants and what she's asking about. Ce désir de prendre des couches depuis des années. Even though in writing, Erica expresses her desire to get hit and slapped, in reality, she's dreading it. Quote, Erica is dreadfully afraid of being hit. She therefore hits on an idea. We can keep writing letters to each other. She boasts that their correspondence can become even raunchier than this letter. It was only a beginning and a start has been made. May I write another letter? Maybe it will be better. The woman longs for him to kiss her intensely, not hit her. He can kiss her painfully so long as he doesn't hit her. End quote. From this passage, it's evident that writing is a way for Erica to express how she feels, and she is fine with keeping her fantasy in this form. Her letter is not some type of SM contract as it might look at first. Erica is not educated about these things at all. There is no mention of a safe word in her letter, no indication that this will be her and Walter's routine from now on. Even the torture box with ropes and whips and masks Erica keeps under the sofa reminds me of all the dresses which are rotten away in her closet. There is no information about the origin of this box, no proof that 
she's ever used it. These objects are like souvenirs, reminders of how suffocated Erica feels every day, or they also might be the tools she wants to use to end her existence. On the surface, it might seem like this letter is finally Erica's attempt at seizing power over at least some aspect of her life. Everything is on her terms now. But then, she gives Walter full control to punish her however he wants if at any point she pleads him to stop the whole thing. To be honest, to me, Erica's written wish almost reads like a goodbye letter. Erica's letter only describes one time encounter between her and Walter. At the end of the letter, she gives him instructions to leave her tied up, get all the keys to the rooms and the apartment, and lock her and her mother inside. No details of how and when she's supposed to be freed. Even Walter realizes that no one can endure such a torture without dying sooner or later. He tries to explain to Erica that she underestimates his strength. So in my opinion, Erica either wants to consciously or subconsciously unalive herself because she's a very depressed person and she might even feel that she deserves such a punishment. Or Erica sees this torment as a last resort to get all the pent-up energy and emotions out of her, to finally feel alive. Travis suffers from depression as well. You can tell that he is more mentally ill than Erica as he is gradually spiraling out of reality. He knows that nothing good awaits him at the end of his violent plan. He is prepared to sacrifice himself. Maybe you can view it as a public suicide. After killing people at the brothel, he tries to unalive himself and in my opinion, he does die from his wounds. The story of the piano teacher is very heavy and depressing, but at the same time, there are a lot of moments specifically between Erica and Walter which are comical and play with the notion of gender roles. The following events that transpire because of Erica's letter tackle the differences between the sexes. At first, Walter struggles to take Erica's letter seriously, but the further he reads, the angrier and more frustrated he becomes that Erica dared to give him orders. He's also baffled, and rightfully so, by Erica's indifference towards his wants and needs. Ça va ouvrir quoi pour moi, tout ça? In the end, Walter feels disgusted with Erica, so he storms out of her apartment. Manisha Dekka, an associate professor at the University of Victoria, in her research paper, which touches on the piano teacher, writes that Erica's inability to perform the traditional, gently affectionate sexual female role is what puzzles and enrages Walter. Erica basically denies him his manly prerogative. Even Elfriede Jelinek, the writer of the novel, in one of the interviews states that, quote, the right to choose a man and also to dictate how he tortures her, that is domination in submission. This, Erika is not permitted, end quote. Walter's reaction to the letter forces Erica to fall back into this conventional female role. She immediately demonstrates the people-pleasing behavior. The next day, Erika puts on a pretty dress, finds Walter and apologizes to him. Pardon moi pour la lettre. J'étais idiot. She acts the way he wanted her to act from the very beginning. She's soft-spoken and affectionate. She's ready to satisfy him in the typical manner, so to speak. Envie de moi, no? Things don't really go according to Erica's plan. As I've said before, she has an adverse reaction to physical intimacy, so she ends up throwing up. But there's actually more context to this scene which the movie's version decided not to focus on, and that is Walter's inability to perform, which frustrates him immensely. Erica's physical aversion ends up rubbing even more salt in Walter's ego wound, and he resorts to insults. Tu sais que tu peux être aussi moins. This incident puts Walter in a state of frenzy. He does a complete 180 in terms of his behavior. The shocking lust for violence awakens within him. He goes to a park late at night where he battles the desire to hurt somebody, an animal or a passerby. Eventually, Walter winds up under Erica's apartment windows where he attempts to pleasure oneself until he gets a chance to come inside the building. Walter's banging wakes Erica up from her sleep and she lets him inside. She wholeheartedly and naively believes that Walter has come to apologize and mend their relationship, but unfortunately, this isn't the case. Ah! In the book, when Walter comes in, he tells Erica straight away that there's nothing worse than a woman who wants to rewrite creation, which fits well into the whole gender dynamic theory between the two characters. Walter has been emasculated by Erica, and now he wishes to completely humiliate her. Initially, it looks like he's finally acting out Erica's fantasy. This is exactly what she wanted. The threats, the slaps, the locking of her mother in the room. And it's true to some extent. The story touches on the fantasy versus reality theme pretty well. Sometimes we like the idea of something more than the actual act of doing it. Sometimes fantasy just simply don't live up to our expectations, and it's better for them to stay as fantasies. This horrible experience with Walter surely forced Erica to realize that. But Walter wasn't even trying to fulfill her fantasy to begin with. It quickly becomes clear that he is mocking her letter and isn't trying to follow the instructions. Is, is, is it really that you, you imagined? No, 
The biggest shock comes when Walter decides to essay Erica, something that she did mention in her writing, but she pictured it more as an announcement and a threat rather than an action. Always talk about more than you actually do, she instructed in the letter. Yet, Walter came to demonstrate his dominance and reclaim his masculinity. Both movies, The Piano Teacher and Taxi Driver, showcase worst-case scenarios on both sides. When incels say that it's easier for women to find a man to sleep with, it's true on paper. However, what they fail to realize is that women bear way more risks when it comes to intimate relationships. Pregnancy risks, safety risks. The worst thing a woman does to Travis is reject him. He doesn't sleep with the woman he wants. Erica, on the other hand, has various sexual encounters, but none of them are good. And in the end, she gets violently attacked by a man she trusted. It could have ended way worse for her. Erica doesn't contact the police after Walter leaves. Instead, she tries to meet him the following day. In the novel, Erica directly goes to Walter's engineering school to confront him. However, in the movie, she has a big concert to perform at. Both Walter and Erica's mother will be there. Erica packs a knife in her purse on the way out, and she is herself unsure if she will even use it. When she sees Walter with his friends happy and nonchalant, Erica just can't take the pain. She's completely powerless. The frustration from inability to get justice and exact revenge pushes her to use the knife on herself. After that, she just storms out of the building. This scene, again, represents the notion that women, femcells, tend to take out their anger and violence on themselves compared to incels who take it on other people. Even though what Erica does to her student Anna fits into the second group, I think since it's an interpersonal conflict, it's a bit different and Erica definitely didn't intend to kill Anna. Travis, compared to her, commits a random act of violence, murdering two people he doesn't even know. The ending of Taxi Driver is a clear example example of an incel dream, at least to me. As I've said, I believe that Travis doesn't survive the shootout. The epilogue, which plays as Travis's fantasy, presents him as a hero. The press is talking about him, Iris's parents are thanking him, and finally, even Betsy is looking at him differently when one day she gets into his taxi. When Travis drops her, he declines to take her money, driving off with a smile. In his mind, he becomes the Chad, and he finally gets his twisted revenge on Betsy, proving how shallow women are. The original ending and the movie's ending of the piano teacher gave off completely different impressions. The film makes it seem like Erica's had enough and her running away and dropping everything can be viewed as a freeing moment and a break from her mother and her old life. In the novel, however, Erica knows the direction she must take after seeing Walter. She goes back to her apartment where her mother is waiting for her. She seeks the familiar comfort and you can sense her helplessness, but as a reader, you feel disappointed with Erica's character because you know she has a chance to break free. Elfrida Jelinek has said that her character Erica Erica is not insane. Quote, neurotic but not insane. An unleaved sexuality expressed in voyeurism. A woman who can't partake in life or in desire. Even the right to watch is a masculine right. The woman is always the one who is watched, never the one who watches. In that respect, to express it psychoanalytically, we are dealing here with a phallic woman who appropriates the male right to watch and who therefore pays for it with her life." End quote. I think Travis and Erica serve as great archetypes of an incel and a femcel, and even though it might seem that there are two sides of the same coin, they demonstrate that men and women are not entirely equal when it comes to romantic relationships due to the way we are nurtured and natured, and we have to tackle slightly different problems, although at the end of the day, we all strive to be accepted and loved.